I welcome one and all to the second week of the BVI's first literary festival, to be known as the BVI Lit Fest. I trust many have enjoyed the first annual address by the Virgin Islands Poet Laureate delivered at our opening ceremony at the beginning of Culture and Tourism Month on the 1st of November. I was also pleased to hear that the Writing with Writers workshops last week on poetry, nonfiction, and publishing filled quickly. Today we begin our Let's Talk Lit Panel discussions. I'm so excited by the accomplishments and talent of the panel participants. We will have the Virgin Islands Magic Fiction Panel, the First Tongues Poetry Panel, the Enter Delete Craft and Technique Essay Panel, and the Unseen Race and Gender in VI Society's Nonfiction Talk. Intrigued? So am I. I welcome you to the second week of the BVI Lit Fest. Welcome to the 2021 BVI Literary Festival. A first of its kind festival that celebrates and promotes a love of literature and writing in the Virgin Islands. This week's event features a Let's Talk a Lit panel discussion series with authors, essayists, and poets like Andre Bagu, Amanda Chukwan, Amilcar Sinatan, Tammy Navarro, Tiffany Yannick, Cadwell Turnbull, Raymond Antrobus, Des Sibaran, and Kinesio Lubrin. The BVI Literary Festival is a collaboration between the Department of Culture and the H. Lavadistao Community College. And it's brought to you by the National Bank of the Virgin Islands, CCT, Two It Four Media, Alaman and Cadero, Nuck Bookshop, and the Poet Laureate Program. And now, your moderator for tonight's panel. Tracy O'Day. Tracy O'Day is an American poet living in Jersey, UK, where she is currently composing a novel in verse and a collection of verse monologues. Her poetry has appeared in the following places, BBC Radio Jersey, Poetry, Cell Poems, Literary Matters, The Hopkins Review, The Jersey Evening Post, Jersey Arts Center, Jersey Library, Goethe Institute, and elsewhere. A poetry editor for the literary journals Smartish Pace and Moko Caribbean Arts and Letters. O'Day is the author of two poetry collections, Waving and Restricted Movement, for which she received a seed funding grant from Art House Jersey. Please welcome Tracy O'Day. Can you hear me? Just making sure that the sound is working. Yes, sound, hello. Okay, um, I wanna thank everyone for coming. I especially want to thank Dep Deputy Premier, Dr. The Honorable Natalia, Natalia Wheatley for kicking off our panel discussions for the BVI Literary Festival. And thank you, Poet Laureate of the Virgin Islands and President of H. Lavity Stout Community College. Dr. Richard Georges, and Director of Culture, Dr. Catherine Smith, for organizing this event and for inviting me to participate today. Welcome students, teachers, lovers of literature, and other esteemed audience members. I feel honored and humbled to be hosting Enter Delete Craft and Technique essay panel with impressive panelists, Andre Bagu, Amanda Chukwan, and Amokar Sanatan. 
three celebrated writers from the Caribbean. We are incredibly lucky to have an opportunity to learn from these writers who so deftly weave their own experiences into their essays, whether they're writing about snakes and ladders, George Floyd, or gender expectations in the Caribbean. The program for today's panel will go as follows. We will first meet each writer and listen to them read some of their published work. Then we'll have a brief interval, followed by a discussion about the craft of writing essays. After that, we'll have another short break, then an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. If you have questions at any time, please post them in the YouTube comments and we will address them at the end of the session. So I was supposed to be starting with Andre Bagu, but uh, I haven't seen him appear yet. So I'm going to start with Amanda Chu Kwan. So first of all, um, I'm really excited to introduce you to Trinidadian Jamaican writer, Amanda Chu Kwan. Her writing appears in Harper's Bazaar, Teen Vogue, Nylon, Huff Post, Caribbean Beat, Callaloo, and elsewhere. Many of her essays deal with contradictions in society and her attempts to confront and embrace or reconcile some of those contradictions. While she appreciates Caribbean writers of the past, she finds even more inspiration from her family, friends, and contemporaries. Dedicated to building community for other Caribbean writers, Amanda Chu Kwan is a literary organizer who is dedicated to the cause, in her words, of creating more opportunities for Caribbean writers in real, tangible ways. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, and for everyone for inviting me to fellow panelists, um, it feels amazing to be here, to be in, in this kind of company. Um, okay, so I think I'm expected to read now. Um, and I, um, I was thinking about what to read and I just settled on um, this piece that I published in Lit Hub this year, which is called um, In America Language Silences You on Trusting Words When They Feel Betray and Redeem, because um, I love having conversations with writers about how um, we hate writing. You know, writing isn't easy. Um, it's, it's a task. And, um, and so I just wanted to explore why. So I'll, I'll begin. Growing up, I valued eloquence. I wanted to be a writer. Eloquence was American. It was big haired morning talk show hosts who didn't stutter. It was Robert Frost's formalism taught to me in my Catholic secondary school in Trinidad. It was a three paragraph essay. It was conclusions that conclude. But when I arrive in the US much later on a scholarship to become a writer, it occurs to me that I can't speak. Later in a writing workshop, I will realize that I do that. Not not speaking, rather that when I write about myself, I relate things as I first describe them in my head instead of flat out describing the action. Like instead of the above simply saying, I've arrived in the US as a grown writer on scholarship, I can't speak. I won't know where it comes from, this tendency to track the firing of my neurons back to its original source, whether it is compulsive or protective, whether it is a sign that as a young writer, I fi I'm finally receiving this gift from the gods, that slip of a thing called style, or whether it is a line of critique on my nonfiction to read in shame, wondering who else can see that when I grew up as an only child, my best friend was my own head. But here I am, a Caribbean woman with English as my first language, unable to use it. I am in the bus, and the bus is full of Americans, most of them white. It is a bus that will take me to L from LAX, where I think I've just seen Jennifer Garner and her dimples. To Van Nuys, place someone near me has termed the valley. It is my first time in Los Angeles. I picture depression. Before I left for Los Angeles, I was invited to last event in Trinidad. I was told that the writer was celebrated in the experimental poetry circles I would soon meet, though I only knew her for the YA novels she wrote long ago, included in my literature curriculum. It was M. Nobisi Philip, born in Tobago, living in Canada, but in Trinidad for a spell. As she read from Zong, an erasure of the Gregson versus Gilbert case report. Zong was a slave ship that had thrown its cargo, 130 Af enslaved Africans, overboard. In a small yard, Nobisi Philip performed poetry that was not poetry at all. 
She carved away at the reports until all that was left felt like gasping breaths. She stuttered and shook. She wore white and moon. Is this who I was leaving to become? On the bus, I stand in a cramped aisle. I'm afraid to ask anyone with an empty space next to them to allow me to sit. It is a fear that is old, but feels new again, like fresh sweat. I don't know where to put my hands. That would be that I would be the one to mute my voice with something I neither predict nor control. I'd spent time in the US before, stretches of summers with friends from all over the world, Trinidadian and white and otherwise, eating pupusas at the Red Hook Bowl fields, flicking cheese off the same fingers I was too afraid to wrap around the handles built into, into the backs of the occupied chairs. Meanwhile, my sudden meekness disturbed me. I arrived at the art school that housed my MFA, a weird interdisciplinary program picked because I recognized my rigidity and because I wanted to know what else my writing could do. But a month afterwards, two months afterwards, it wouldn't go away. I'd freeze whenever somebody asked me about David Foster Wallace, who I never learned about at my Jamaican university. It was as though I'd already been primed to see my culture's inferior, a thing I'd absorbed and held in my head, a belief I didn't realize I'd still had, since I spent all of my first degree reckoning with things like cultural hegemony and black respectability, eventually cultivating a pride in who I was and where I was from despite myself. I never thought that what would hold me back would be psychological, that I would develop habits around my anxiety, pausing whenever someone spoke to me so that I could translate my response in my head. I wasn't just hyper aware that my education seemed to have no place here. I was aware that my accent didn't either. I'd go to bed promising that I wouldn't lose it, that I wouldn't slant my vowels and bend my hard consonants just to be understood. I'd recount all the ways I saw people who'd come back from, to Trinidad with a slightly American accent after time abroad, a freshwater Yankee, be treated with disdain. But even when I said my name, it caused mild confusion. The woke and good nation would imitate it the way I said it. This is why man translates to mon for Americans when Caribbean people say it, I realized, as people called me a monda and I blithely smiled along. I'd eventually avoid words that I thought would highlight my accent altogether. Using the vocabulary I supposed helped me win that scholarship to find synonyms that would help me to express half a self. Sometimes I'd just shut up. There would certainly be times that I'd experience racism intimately and overtly. When the executor of my scholarship berated me loudly in front of white faculty and esteemed guests for forgetting to hold the door open for her at a restaurant. My head was bowed while texting my friends, I don't belong here. That time my stepfather was hassled by a mall cop in the Glendale Ga Galleria, who assumed with all the shopping bags that my mother and I plied on him that he was in fact homeless. What I experienced among the white people at school was difficult to articulate. Many were friends, teachers I respected. There was an inherent shame in discussing my discomfort and clarifying even to myself, even to myself, whether it hung in the atmosphere or whether it languished in my head. If it was the latter, all the better to deny its existence. But no, in my more lucid moments and among my black friends, I could admit that what I felt was real. My mind could relax because it was telling the truth. There was a reason I knew why instinctively, why the people in my classes would not be interested in the Caribbean books I brought from home or why I knew that my rule with my white male friends could only ever be one of friendship. I peeled back memories of those long summers in Brooklyn, memories that held truths I'd blocked out, or back, that, back then, as I experienced racism for the first time in the company of people I thought I'd liked. Before I arrived in the US, I thought that racism meant pe that people hated you. I didn't realize that it could also mean disinterest, struggling to articulate myself as real in a world that either saw me as not worth its time or wanted me to really know how guilty it felt for seeing me this way. This compounded my desire to write about race and perform my work aloud, even though it terrified me. I think I'll end there. Thank you so much. Still don't hear you.
Tracy, I think you may need to check your mic. Thank you. Everything good now? Okay, Tracy, sorry about this, but you, you've gone again. Okay, am I here? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, if I go again, thank you so much for letting me know. Um, this continues to be a problem. I would like to welcome Andre Bagu. Uh, I wanted to let you know about his amazing collection called The Undiscovered Country. It's a collection of essays that covers topics that range from performance po poems of St. Lucian poet Jane King to the possible insurgent sympathies for the Disney film, The Little Mermaid. Entre brilliantly hints, nudges, and coerces readers to investigate topics along with him, flattering us by taking for granted a depth of knowledge as profound as his own, while at the same time educating us on often undiscovered topics and poets, and leading this reader down a rabbit hole of poetry that I am very happy never to escape. I highly recommend his collection, The Undiscovered Country. Please welcome Andre Bagu to our forum. Hi, good night, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tracy. And you know, it wouldn't be an online event if there wasn't any sort of technical hitch. Oh, um, and sorry for being late, my computer crashed. I don't know why, but yeah, it just happened. Um, so as Tracy mentioned, I am the author of The Undiscovered Country, which is a, a collection of essays. And I'm going to actually read from one of the essays in the book uh, called Romantics in Trinidad. Everyone knew I was gay before I did. One aunt called me troubled advised that I lose weight by chewing my food more slowly, and cautioned my parents against letting me take art lessons. Her son had had a bad experience with an art teacher in Port of Spain, she said. It was much later that I came to realize that all the criticisms and the constant attempts at refashioning me were rarely attempts to refashion herself and her own life. And I only came to realize slash admit slash accept the fact of my own queerness when, in my last years of secondary school, I read Jane Eyre. It might seem hard to credit this, but I pictured myself as Jane, wandering the moors, standing up to rich people, standing up to bigots, defending persecuted Helens, rejecting conventions, acting for her man, for love. The book's gothicism was remixed in my imagination, absorbed into my tropical terrain. The moors of Yorkshire became the Carony Swamp. The blue ignus fortuus glow hanging over the marsh became the flaming sukuyas of local folklore who sucked your blood at night. The jitrash was a giant mutant potong from the streets of St. James. The fairies and sprites in Rochester's imagination became people, real people in my life. Jane took over, and I walked with her to flame. I hadn't yet come to appreciate how her narrative had wronged Mrs. Rochester, as Jaurice shows us. I became rebellious. Every month, the top students would have to parade at assembly and receive special assessment cards. I crumpled mine, said to the new principal who had replaced Father Dick, education is a farce. I shaved my curly hair. I lost weight. What's going on? He asked. I wanted to get back to my roots, I said, half jokingly, half defiantly. He put the cigarette he was smoking into an ashtray, looked at me warily and said, 
I expected better from you. He dismissed me. Behind the scenes, when I was not being an activist against the hegemony of the capitalist education system, I pined after a boy, wrote poems for him, made a chapbook and gave it to him. He didn't quite feel the same way, which after a while became a distressingly embarrassing situation to be in. Anybody who thinks the icy romanticism of early 19th century music, literature, and art is at odds with a tropical landscape has obviously not experienced my life. Nor have they experienced the rain here, how it can come on suddenly like a love affair, intense, announcing itself only seconds before with lightning and thunder, the bellow of wind, of wind through trees, of deluge assailing distant surfaces, hammering, hammering galvanized roofs, a hail of metal on metal, the earth yielding its faint incense until the frenzy is over as abruptly as it had begun, leaving nothing but the torn cerement of the sky as you wonder, did that just happen? I'll, I'll stop there. Let's hope that my mic is working. It is. Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Andre. That was amazing. I love hearing you read. It's even better hearing your voice than when I'm reading it on the page. Uh, now we have Amilcar Sanatan. I've had the privilege of reading Amilcar Sanatan's poetry and nonfiction in Moko Caribbean Arts and Letters, uh, where I'm a poetry editor. His work has also appeared in the Caribbean Review of Gender Studies, the Caribbean Writer, Toot Moon, Cordite Poetry Review, Sinking City, and elsewhere. A poet, essayist, musician, spoken word artist, blogger, and educator, Amilcar Sanatan's work addresses themes of masculinity, gender performance, his literary predecessors, and actually most aspects of Caribbean culture. I really want to give a warm welcome to Amilcar. Thank you very much, Tracy, for the introduction. I, I almost didn't do my presentation this evening uh, when you read that description. So it's a great pleasure to hear from you and, and all the positive affirmations as well. And uh, this evening, I will read an excerpt from an essay I wrote entitled My Mother, Mary, and Me. For a long time, loving God and loving church meant the same as loving my mother. The church I attended was home to an aging community of believers. Few youth, the majority women in flower dresses, about four working fans, and a door perpetually open for sinners. In church, my mother prayed, sang, knelt, and fanned as she oversaw her children in the front pews every Sunday. She wanted to bring us closer to the Roman Catholic Church and the God that was said to have resided in it. She probably thinks that she has failed in her duty to see all of her boys grow and stay in the orthodoxy and architecture of the church. I will grow to learn and live through the contradictions of faith and the man-made religion she and many other women taught me. For half my life, I sat among women who could not be ordained, the women who possess reservoirs of virtue and prayerfulness as canonized saints. If God had never shown me signs in childhood, I learned to catch them printed on the back of a shirt or cotton dress from a wet cherry curl, or the flame of Miss Noble's dress on glorious Saturday, and the days she felt justified in her political party's leader's positions. I received signs in the invading scent of a flock of 80 year old chess rub with Vicks vapor rub and the circumference of gossip and Maljo Fatantes with the elaborate hats. My mother and her sister were two women whose arms and protection I remember the most. Two mothers, 
Then as I learned to pray and spend devotions contemplating on the holiness of the mother of Christ, Mary quickly became my third mother. My mother's birthday is the day on which the church celebrates the birthday of Our Lady. I had enough proof then that my mother was godly and belonged in heaven. My parents got married in a church and it took pictures of the ceremony to prove my father was married there. My father's face could only be seen on three occasions in a church setting, a baptism, a wedding, and a funeral. When he came to church, he competed with the other men for the pew furthest to the back, from which the priest suffered his eyes. My father, like the congregation of fathers, were absent from church and equally absent from their families. Yet, in concrete terms for believers, to be close to God was to be close to a priest, and to be close to a priest was to make larger financial contributions or give more hours of service to the house of the Lord. The only payment my mother asked for all her sacrifices was that God blessed her children. In the Roman Catholic tradition, only men can be ordained as priests. In the church I attended, it was a congregation of women worshippers and women worship. The Passion of Christ was a narrative of the pain of a mother. Homilies and the ritual of Mass were lifted by the base of women who loved and cared for all children. In my own cosmology, my mother was a Virgin Mary modified. Sunday after Sunday, we sat in the front pews of the church and in this constituency of believers, I'd think that only women believed in God. Did God have breasts and branching stretch marks on her sides? And when she sang, did she hum in that cool and patted voice and touch my head like Christ was touched by his mother too? Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, all of you have absolutely blessed us with these amazing personal essays. And that's the whole point of this conversation is talking about the craft of personal essay writing. But before we move on to the discussion, we have to take a short break to hear from our sponsors. So I'm going to leave that with the tech team. We know that where you choose to bank matters. And it is your vote on what your funds do in strengthening our community. As your official Bank of Paradise, we invest and support the lifeblood of our economy by helping in the realization of personal goals for homeownership, education, and entrepreneurial visions, which support small businesses. We make it our place. is about these people. It's always a pleasure coming to you live and direct from the... What's poppin' was really good? Davis has won it for the Lakers! And we're back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Um, we just had a really compelling discussion about self-censorship and how we decide whose stories we can tell and whose stories we can't tell. Um, and then we have moved on to a discussion about poetry and how that influences writing of prose. And I wanted to let open this up to all of you and let you all jump in and please don't wait for me to ask questions because it's very likely that my mic. So feel free to go ahead, <laughs> just start talking. Well, um, one of the things I did in in my essay collection in Discovered Country was I included um, verse essays 
uh, which are you know basically essays written in poetry form. So they'll actually look like poems on the on the page, and some of them are written in syllabic verse. You know, they have a certain meter and rhyme scheme. Um, and the reason for this gesture was to trouble that boundary between poetry and prose. Because I found that increasingly the similarities in approach to both um, mediums have become even more compelling. I think both poetry and prose are concerned with the audience, are concerned with the reader, are concerned with curating a very specific type of response. And I think in poetry, there's a feeling that sometimes a poem is only a real poem if it's limited to the lyrical, you know, if it if it relates to a certain type of airy-fairy, arty-farty subject matter. Um, and it's just felt as the real life, real life things, that's for prose, you know, um, but sex in prose, but, you know, what have you in prose. But in truth, I am of the strong belief that a poem should be free to accommodate any any subject matter and furthermore have any um, any sort of texture or scope, uh, even including visual images in it. Um, so, I mean, this, this, this issue is really interesting for me because um, increasingly, I think the lines between the two are blurred. That said, you know, I will say that one of the great things about writing an essay collection as opposed to writing a book of poems is that finally I, I have a sense that I have readers. <laughs> because, because, you know, you, you read a poem, you know, and you work on this poem for how many years, you know, and you recite it and maybe two or three people, you know, <laughs> read it. Uh, and then they're like, what the hell does that poem mean? They have no idea what's going on. <laughs> you know, they're like... They approach it in this very literal way, at least with an essay, you know, there's that feeling that, okay, I've been able to bridge the gap between myself and the reader more directly. And perhaps it's harder to hide in an essay than it is to hide in a poem. Yeah, I, um, I, I hear Andre because I think that the, the lines between these conventions don't really exist. I used to think that you know, when I was in school, that poetry could be used to explode a moment or really examine microscopically a thought or emotion or a turn or, or just, just, you know, just a confined, a confined moment. Um, but I think essays do that as well. And I think, you know, the same way that I think that poetry makes arguments and that, that essays have filters or, you know, can, can be quite formal. Um, and I enjoy reading most of all, um, poets and writers who sort of explode those boundaries, like Maggie Nelson, um, um, Marie Howe, I really love her sort of prosaic style of poetry. Um, so yeah, I don't, and I think both of them sort of accomplish the same things in terms of, you know, giving us a glimpse into psyche or reality or context. Um, more and more, I just think that, you know, oral historians and, and all of the all of the people who are responsible for holding the stories of our country for, you know, for various ethnicities, they didn't make those distinctions. Um, you know, when you listen to Kaiso and Trinidad, it's, po it's poetry, it's prose, it's song, it's lyric, it's, it's arguments, it's, it's, um, it's, it's peacock, it's, you know, it's, it's all, it's all manner of things in one. If you hear a folk character like a midnight robber speak, you know, what genre, what genre is that? Um, so I think it's sort of like going back to our roots in terms of, you know, provincial being sort of like boundaryless in, in our expression. We don't, we don't have the, you know, the, the academic terms or the formal terms to describe it, but we sort of just do whatever we want. <laughs> and I, I, I'm increasingly embracing that philosophy in my writing. Sound again. Amanda, I love Maggie Nelson's bluets, by the way, just saying. Yeah, um, it's, so, it's so good. Oh, awesome. You can hear me. I see it. It's working. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for those really thoughtful replies. I totally agree that the lines blur. And I think the more you write, 
Andre, you brought up meter. And I think the more you write in meter, it just tends to infiltrate all of your writing anyway. So it doesn't really matter. You get that rhythm and it just infects everything that you do. And I'm sure that the rest of you have that experience as well. Uh, Andre, one directed to you. Uh, in your essay, Dylan Thomas, Three Encounters, you lament uh, that your original Dylan Thomas essay, the first encounter, the one that you're sort of writing this essay about, um, was full of omissions. So you had admitted days, people, travel, an incident of racism. Um, and your essay on Thomas, you write, was really about yourself. And what I wanted to ask you is, why as writers is it sometimes easier for writers to discover more about themselves when they are writing about someone else, uh, another poet, another writer? Yeah, I think, you know, this goes back to that question of self-censorship. Um, because even when this, this choice is made to avoid the personal in the writing, somehow the personality nonetheless erupts. Uh, it cannot be suppressed. Everything that you write reveals something about yourself. And, you know, one of the things I noticed in some of my favorite essay collections was um, how most essays, uh, even the essays that are intensely about a very specific subject matter that ostensibly has nothing to do with the writer, are ultimately deeply personal because the subject of the essay um, is always inevitably me, the self-writing. You know, um, the novelist Rachel Cust, she has a great way of describing the essay. She says the essay is the blankest of blank pages. Um, and I absolutely love that. And I feel in that essay, I, <laughs> I was inspired by Margaret Atwood's pretty famous essay on Kafka, um, where she wrote an essay that was basically a critique of an essay she wrote as a teenage high school student, you know, and it's this, it's a brilliant essay, it's a scorching takedown of her own essay as a child. But I was intrigued by that and by the, by the idea of writing an essay that consisted entirely of talking about the omissions in something. So writing an essay that said, these are the limits of my knowledge, this is what I don't know. Uh, and in, in that way, actually communicating what I do know, you know? And so the essay is really structured around all the things I failed to say in my own childhood essay on Dylan Thomas. Um, and I think for me, I, I chose that and I was really drawn to that because I think um, very often, and this is coming closer to your question, you might feel as though you're not writing about yourself, but the subject matter that you have chosen, the reason why you chose it is incredibly personal. There's a reason why I chose to write about Dylan Thomas. There's a reason why, you know, various essay collections, there's so many different subject matters. The author has chosen and curated to present certain essays as opposed to others. And I think, you know, just to go back to what Amanda was saying, perhaps it's like um, this notion of the carnival costume. You know, Amanda talks about the midnight robber we think of costumes as things we put on that hide us or disguise us. But actually, costumes reveal us as much as they conceal us. Because our choice of what we, or how we choose to present ourselves to the world, tells us something about our own psyche and our own perception of ourselves, and perhaps even our own desires and our own fears. Um, so I think that's why choosing something else that, <laughs> that may, may seem irrelevant is somehow magically the key to actually coming right back to the heart. <clears throat> yeah, Mike, that you Just asking if anyone else wants to jump in and talk about how sometimes writing about someone else reveals a lot about yourself. I know that you've both written about, you've written personal essays about uh, Caribbean writers. Uh, I know that Amanda, you've written about George Floyd and Bob Marley. So how has writing about those 
other writers uh, revealed things about you. Melka, do you want to take this? If I may, thanks, Amanda. Mm -hmm. um, you could always go to you as well. Um, I think, you know, the other day I had the opportunity to speak to the graduates at my secondary school. And um, it's quite interesting. Um, the first protest that I organized was when I was 17, when my school didn't allow me to grow my natural hair. And, uh, you know, who would have known when I was 17 and over a decade after you would have this expression of the Black Lives Matter in 2020, you know, and the school um, and the leadership at the time, you know, it really taught me a lesson in power. I, I wouldn't just say it's post-colonial racism. That is an easy critique to have. Um, what it was, it was a school contending with old ideals. And, but it was new, literally new. It's a newly established school, but have these old ideals, respectability, what is a good student. And then I'm representing the new, but now contending with that and trying to chart what our history is. And uh, to see the rules change and so on um, for many years after, um, because of students continually raising an issue, you know, and not just accepting concessions. And the administration showing the capacity for growth. It lets all young people understand that you are part of a bigger narrative, and a bigger narrative is also part of you. And I think that is where we have some, some hope in life. And... Uh, that that makes a lot of sense. We this is so obvious through music. That is sometimes music is a realm where we don't identify with that specific experience. But something about Lincoln Park, right, is going to be speaking to you. Something about Tracy Chapman, something about Bob Marley in the seventies. Even as a ska artist, was telling me something about love. I grew up listening to jazz a lot. I was not wrong when jazz was as popular as it was. But I I love Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong, April in Paris, and I was living in Barbados at the time. So there was something about April in Paris, uh, me studying French and, and, and matching meanings to it becomes impressive, beautiful, dynamic, and profound. And therefore, I think the reason why we so-called write about others, the first step is about resonance. A character elicits something in us that what we call curiosity, is, is sometimes what is our value? We understand our values in relation to somebody else. When we look at bodies, when we talk about role models, and you see half naked people at a young age, I must see in other bodies like, wow, look, they took ownership of their bodies. I couldn't wait to grow up to exhibit my body like that, you know? Um, these are the things that I think human interaction becomes important. But at the same time, sometimes it is even easier to write about oneself. Because to write about the others becomes very difficult. I know some writers, they need a parent to die before they write truly as a writer. They need an abuser to go to the next country to get away from the abuser to finally write to become that writer. So it's not always easier to even speak through other characters. Um, sometimes speaking about ourselves becomes a kind of refuge, um, especially if we think, or make ourselves smaller. And on the last thing is why I think resonance is important. I think that is where we should always keep work because I think we will keep matching identities with work. Um, I read people because they have the same complexion as me, same ethnic background as me, same country as me. And for me, a, a writer is not born into a nationality. Well, they do officially, but we born into geography. You're not born with a national flag on you. You know, it's, it's good that you identify these things. I identify with those things um, myself, but at the same time, I, I I treat it like attention. And when I was listening to Biggie Small suicide suicidal thoughts when I was very young, I never forgot the reaction when we read Derek Walcott's A Letter from Brooklyn in my secondary school in Form Three, and I remember the last line. It says. So this old lady writes, and again, I believe, I believe it all, and for no man's death, I grieve. Now, none of they will connect their girl talking about the letter to his mother, his relationship to art, but at that time, we loved gangster music so much. It was just like, yo, this is a gangster line, and now this no man's death, I grieve, it just resonated, you know? And I know Derek Walker wasn't trying to write for our 
Neanderthals of a hot afternoon classroom in Form 3. Um, but the line does that. So I think, so I, I can extend that the idea is not just about the facility of writing through other persons or writing about ourselves, but fundamentally our work seeks to resonate, you know? It seeks to resonate. And in, in place of that word, we sometimes use the word audience. Amanda, did you want to add anything? Oh, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just realized my own myself. Um, so I was just saying that, Amelka, what you said really resonated with me. And also, I think that fundamentally, writers are paranoid creatures. So that when we interact and interface with other people, we're, we're constantly tuning or retuning, observing, or taking notes, or thinking about what someone else is thinking, or considering their reactions. And I like that essays just allow us to be upfront about that paranoia, so that I can um, sort of immediately say, okay, you know, kind of put someone as a subject to the fore and say, I am examining this person. And it was really interesting that you brought up the Bob Marley essay, because Bob Marley is such a, you know, such an iconic figure that so many people have written about. And so it was fun excavating, you know, like and imagining. And I think that's sort of where the line between poetry and prose or essay sort of blurs because there was a lot of like imaginative possibility work in that essay that sort of felt as though it, it became something more than just an argument where I had to think about and piece together from all of these, um, you know, documented records. What was he really thinking? What was he thinking when he um, would purposely speak to British journalists in Patwa so that they wouldn't understand him. Um, and when I and then when I really sort of did that work was was when I started to make those connections between my way of of dealing with the world, my mother's way of dealing with the world as a as an immigrant. And I really, you know, connected with him and, and resonated with him as a again an imagined character fable in in some ways. Um, and no, I loved without sitting down and doing that process. And when I learned how to teach essay writing, it was like, you know, it was very different how I learned it in school. When I, when I was in university, it was like, you can, you can think through, like use your essay to process your thoughts, process your thoughts on the page. And, um, and it was through, you know, processing the thoughts and sitting down and really thinking through, okay, where do someone's actions come from? Was a way of also processing, you know, my own responses to the world. So, um, so, yeah. Great. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, I definitely have Andre figured out my mic problem, but we haven't figured out how to solve it. So we know it exists. Uh, but we don't know what to do with it. I have a question from our chat. And it was actually a question I was going to ask you anyway. Um, it's about your influences. And even more so, what about essayists who have influenced you? Because we we talk about Caribbean writers who have influenced you and poets. We've talked about musicians who have influenced you. Um, but Dr. Georges brings up the fact that there are certain essayists whose works have really with, withstood uh, the test of time. He mentioned Sonnet, Baldwin, and Didion. And just wondering if there are any essay writers who specifically have influenced you all. Uh, Amanda, do you want to start and take this one? Sure. Um, first of all, I love the I love the um, the writers that, that Richard um, referenced because they've all influenced me. Um, you know, Sonnet's um, brash on a feminism um everything baldwin um the way that didion does weave um the lyrical into her observations of society and into her you know what is fundamentally journalism um i'm, I'm also influenced by people like ty miller by andre um who's who's on this panel um uh, by kwami Turi. um just really by people who were unafraid to express themselves in a time that um, that did not allow for it. 
um, people who weren't afraid of being misunderstood, which as a writer is, I think, my, my deepest fear that somehow I don't express myself fully. Somehow there's something lacking for my writing. So I love um, writing that shows evidence of people who did not care about those kinds of things. Or even if they did, they, they, they wrote it anyway. Um, those are my, yeah, those are my influences. And do you think that you have gotten some bravery from those writers? Because you definitely tackle topics that are controversial and where you, and you, you definitely do sort of wear your heart on the page. And do you think that that has come, some of that bravery has, has come from their bravery? Yeah, I think that, um, that as a writer, one of the best things you can do, and I think it was by the Francis who told me this, but it's, it's about sort of assembling your table. So you before you before you write um this has always been a metaphorical table to me because i can't really get my stuff together um when i write so it's sort of you think about you know you bring forward any talismans any objects any influences you have and you just you know you think of it as a buffet so for me it's it's almost as though you're conjuring the mentors in your head that you wished you could have um i have some terrific mentors but also you know i think through i really do think through you know, if I was writing to these people, if I was in conversation with these people, what, you know, what, how would that affect how I write? You know, what, what would I take from that conversation? And um, these, you know, these are works that I turn to constantly when, you know, I have favorite essays that I look at before I write. So it's sort of just, you know, preparing my headspace so I know what to enter. I know what sort of tonality I want to, to imitate. And yeah, um, I'm gonna get better ending my thoughts, I think. Thank you. Uh, and Amilcar, how do you feel about this topic? Who has influenced you? Uh, what essayists specifically have you read that have given you a sense of power to, feel, to be able to express yourself in the same way? Oh, for sure. Well, I love to read, you know, so, um, but I, I, I like my pool. I, I think we all have different styles and you hear it in our work. Um, in terms of being disrespectful, I admire V.S. Naipaul, you know. This man disrespectful to mother, grandmother, you know, and something about that, like, I can't share the comments that I write on the side of the pages in the book, but that is when I'm in conversation, like, really? Like, that's how you just talk? You know, I what it is, I like the, the hot mouth, you know, that uncle in the family line, and of course, uh, perhaps I would occupy a version of that in hopefully less patriarchal tones uh, to, to assume that role in my family. So, but there was a kind of uh, way that he brought an irreverence, which is what I like all the time, um, to the page. He did it with other peers. And of, of course, I, I don't identify with a lot of the the political positions of V.S. Naipaul takes, but uh, I, I do admire the, the style, the aesthetics, the tone, um, and the way he writes. Gordon Lewis is a social scientist who was based in the University of Puerto Rico for a long time. I believe he's from Wales, but he did Caribbean studies as well. He's a visionary for me. Um, Zora Neale Hurston, in terms of uh, her work in anthropological studies, were profound. So it, Yes, she wrote essays, but you know it was really her work. But the the way that she sought to describe culture um, stuck out to me. Um, in terms of the younger ones now, I would say Gabrielle Bello. Um, I hope I pronounce her last name right. I've, I've never really I don't know her personally, and I never really talk about her before. But I read her stuff that she publishes online, and um, thinking about trans identities and what does language look like with that subjectivity is quite interesting, but as a Caribbean person in the diaspora as well, it was profound for me. Ocean Vuong, again, looking at language, I, I believe Vietnamese, I, I hope I'm not uh, misrepresenting his identity, Vietnamese, American kind of reality, um, that's beautiful. And again, of course, my bias is a bit political, so Arundhati Roy, and um, I would say Edward Dantica, um, those are like the writers that I really rock with. And as you could see um, in my box of essays, it's the problematic ones and the, the political ones and the side of justice, but um, that's how I learn anyway. And that's the reality I know.
Thank you for your honesty. And I, I, I love that. I think we all sort of seek ourselves in the writers we read as well as the writers we discuss to continue our discussion from earlier. And Andre, what about you? Yeah, um, for me, uh, The Undiscovered Country was really written under the influence of a whole series of essays, specifically essay writers. Um, Salman Rushdie's uh, essay collection, Imaginary Homelands, was really important to me, as was George Lamming's um, The Pleasures of Exile, particularly uh, his interrogation of the Tempest in, in one of his early essays in that book. Um, a lot of uh, people like, of course, the usual suspects, CLR James, Amy Césaire, um, played, you know, they were prevailing spirits hovering over some of the longer essays in the book. But because I was also particularly interested in writing about art, I gravitated to people like Susan Sontag and Lorraine O'Grady, who, you know, has perhaps one of my favorite essays of all time, an amazing essay called, uh, called Olympia's Maid, which is the study of um, the famous painting. Um, and yeah, James Joyce was another um, essayist that I was drawn to, drawn to. Walcott, Derek Walcott, you know, a lot of people forget that Walcott was also an incredible writer of prose. I mean, his essays are just out of this world. And yes, Naipaul, uh, of course, with all of his um, provocations, but also the style of his writing, his prose, particularly um, the shorter pieces, um, can't you know can't teach you a lot about writing. And just like Amanda said, um, sometimes you do soak yourself in 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 other writers who you admire to kind of get that that you know vibe on you know and i and i read a lot of contemporary essays as well including amanda's you know uh which which are always incredibly amazing um and that i think that's the key i guess for anybody looking on you know wanting to start writing um reading is <laughs> fundamental um and it's important to read a lot of what is going what is being published right now as well as uh to read the classics that is perfect. That actually leads right into my next question. And I wanted to say first that I really have loved preparing for this panel and reading all, all three of your work. It's been an absolute joy for me to sort of get into your psyches because that's what you do when you're writing an essay is you're, you're sort of writing your brain on the page. And it's been so beautiful sharing hours and hours with the three of you unbeknownst to you um as we know tracy the spy has been has been in your brains and in your youtube and having a lot of fun with it and just really it's been an absolute joy um but you just gave some advice andre which was to read and that is obviously the best advice that you can give any writer is to read and read writers that you admire um what other advice would you give aspiring writers of personal essays. Uh, I will start with Amanda with this one since Andre just gave his first bit of advice. What advice? Um, yeah, definitely to read, um, also to just go out and observe. And I think um, to really examine those places where you feel discomfort the most. So if there are sort of nodes of discomfort that happen in various activities or in the process of writing itself to really lean into that. Um, I think that's the best, the best advice that I could give. Also, actually, I just have one more thing, which is to, to engage with literary community always. Um, I, I feel as though in Trinidad, we sort of think, and I, I've experienced this with a lot of people who come up to me and ask me about it, just the sense of writing alone, um, that writing is solitary, um, that literary communities outside of festivals or formal spaces don't necessarily exist. And for me, I really would not be where I was without, um, you know, my, my writing group. Um, I'm not in it anymore, but it was through, you know, consistently writing every week that I was able, and with other people, that I was able to build a portfolio that, you know, very practically allowed me to apply to residencies, fellowships, um, MFA programs, et cetera, et cetera. And you can find literary community overseas. Um, you can find literary community at home. Um, Twitter is your tool when it comes to contacting writers, DMing them, and you know, again, very practical 
forms of advice, but please don't think that you're limited by geography. You really are not. That's really good advice. Uh, and also, I do, I mean, as much as social media can be a hindrance to writing because you can be spending too much time on it when you should be writing, as we've probably all experienced, it is also a great place to meet other writers and to form a writing community. So uh, Amilcar, what do you think about this? What advice do you give young writers? Because I know that you, you do mentor young writers and what do you tell them? It's so bad, like I, I'm, I'm my most incoherent in literary platforms, you know, because like in political environments, you have to be very clear with your arguments. And so please forgive um, my lack of very clear points. But I, I think it's about taking risks. And um, what is the risk? You know, I, I try to ask that to the writer. And in that essay, I think a risk needs to be very, um, it's not just one idea any structure, you know, how do you undermine something? I like to see that at work and emotionally, what is the risk, you know? Were you afraid that somebody would read this? And when someone read it to you, how did you feel? And I think uh, when I kind of engage those things and I know I'm really writing and just in a broad way, I, I hope there's some sincerity in the work that we do and not authenticity as a claim and an I and what is real or not, but uh, to really put yourself into the work. And I take um, my cue from the 20th to 21st century philosopher, Jay-Z, the husband of Beyonce. And where I'm from, he says, your word is everything. So everything you said you do, you did it. Can't talk about it if you ain't live it. You know, so that's where I kind of get my guidance. It, and you can listen to Beyonce's husband from time to time. Thank you for that. And speaking of Beyonce's husband, I really love uh, his collection of essays about his lyrics. It's just such a well-constructed book and just really, again, gets into the psyche of the writer. Uh, Richard Georges has another question, which is, he says, there is the possibility that a, a purity is expected in the essay, a linear clarity of thought. And I think that we've actually talked about this a little bit already um, when Amanda was work, walk, talking about the idea of how you can use an essay to work out your thoughts, whereas and, and as, a, as a place of discovery. Um, but normally it starts at point A and ends in point B. And do you think that this is, I mean, do you agree with this concept? Do you think that that's sort of the expectation of an essay. When you start writing one, do you expect to go from A to B? Amilcar, do you want to start with this one? I'll be quick, I'll be quick, you know, but uh, yes, one could have expectations, but uh, that we don't even reproduce that in real life, you know? Sometimes we move in point A to B and then we discover our current rural man, you know, on the side of the road. Sometimes we move from A to B and then somebody hustling you for $5, you know, and then you just turn around here as, you know, I, I should already get back inside, you know, so, or the rainfall, or, or you have these other locations in mind, you know, so I, 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 destinations is a way that you start, you actually take a step, you know, a destination may let you understand where you are in relation to something now. So I think that is what is useful for, but once you start going, uh, you end up where you need to end up. You know, I, I try to be as open about that, but I don't apply that rule to friends. You know, you need to ask permission to come by me. You have to call me in advance and I need to agree before you visit my house, you know. It's not a place where it's just stop off and you want to, I don't know, get off steam and use the bathroom. So, but I, my approach to essays are very different from my intimate relationships. Much. Hold on, mic problems? Oh, good. Thank you so much for clarifying the difference between uh, people stopping by your house and essay writing. That was a gorgeous metaphor. So, Andre, um, how do you, you've written a lot of essays, and in your book, I think you do address this as well, that there's not necessarily a point A to B, but do you have that expectation going in? 
I think certainly, um, you know, one of the things that the essay does really well is it puts ideas on trial. And if we approach a trial by saying, well, we expect a certain verdict and a certain outcome, then it's not really a trial. So to some extent, I want my essays to take me to unexpected places, you know, and I want, I want, you know, even if it's going from point A to B, I still want the ideas to be somehow rigorously interrogated. So I think maybe I like, you know, I but I like, you know, the use of the word purity here as well in Richard's question, because, you know, that, that, you know, it just goes back to, well, what is the appropriate subject matter of an essay versus what is the appropriate subject matter of a poem? And there's, there's really no boundary and there's no, um, no limit. So I think, you know, to some extent, I both agree and disagree. Um, because ultimately, you know, what, whatever is being written, it should be in service of some sort of idea and maybe just to go back um, to that question, you know, what would you tell readers, um, what advice you would give people? I think everything you write, in everything you're, you write, something must be at stake for you, you know? And if, if there's nothing at stake for you in the writing, then what's the point of, you know, of writing it? And maybe if we approach writing in that, from that framework instead of the framework of clarity versus complexity or purity versus, um, I don't know, bacchanalian um, revelry, then maybe um, that might be more, that might be more germane to something. Oh, yeah. Um, it's interesting because I write, um, so I write for both, both for pop publications as well as um, for, you know, ac you know, scholarly writing, ac academic writing. And um, when you're writing for, for sale in a particular kind of way, you know, your editor will ask you and even to have a successful pitch, you will be asked to clarify and to hone down. So in, you know, in, in the writing that we might enjoy and in scholarly writing, you know, you have a title that's like three parts. It's like, I'm thinking about this, this, and this. And um, and you're allowed sort of the freedom to wander. But when you're writing for Harper's Bazaar or any, you know, any kind of, or Teen Vogue, whatever, they're just like, nope, you know, nobody's interested. The average audience is interested in this, you know, take off the two parts of that title, have the end, have one clear idea, stick to that. Um, and I've just increasingly found, no, that's the way that you make money. And, but it's interesting that, you know, we think about the fact that audiences kind of want to have and hold one clear idea in their heads. I don't believe that's true at all. Um, I think that we're in a space right now where it is possible for people to, you know, hold the competing ideas, um, to hold two and three thoughts and to sort of weave them through. I mean, it's why television now is so good. You know, it's because people are embracing you know, narrative forms that come from um, the literary space. And so, um, I, you know, I personally don't think that an essay needs to be pure or necessarily be linear to, ha you know, to express that clarity. Those things don't need to exist in the same space. For me, I find clarity personally in a, so um, thinking of that Bob Marley essay that I wrote, which was kind of just like small vignettes that sort of compared and contrasted different experiences and characters and people and, and you know, um, times in history and um, for me that's my way of, of, of giving meaning or you know building a clear picture of a space or time I think that you know increasingly I find interest in having the audience do the work of building that linear um, structure in, the, in their own minds and not taking it for granted that they're not readers or that they don't engage with narratives that sort of like can, can swirl and fall all over the place again I think that's just part of a Caribbean reality that we do have jagged worldviews. I forget the I forget the scholar who coined that term, but we do have um, complex lives that sometimes don't make sense at all. Um, you know, I feel that way whenever I I call um, uh, something that's supposed to help me in Trinidad. You know, it's like you have a line set up that you that is sort of setting you up to fail. Um, if I need to fix my internet or if I need to get a driver's license. And so it's like living in the Caribbean is like inherent contradiction. And so I think we're used to telling stories about things that don't make sense and holding those thoughts in our head. So why not 
um, express it formally, you know, or structurally in in, in that in that series. Really. So, um, yeah, that's that's why I'm embracing sort of chaos in 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 um in structure these days. I think that was really well put. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the comparison between, you know, how things are sort of messed up and things are a jumble all around us. And why should we expect our essays not to be sort of jumbly bumbly and going all over the place, as Amilcar said, driving around this way and that you know, get asked, being asked for five, five dollars and getting stopped. And I think that that's a really good point uh, that actually essays and television shows, as you brought up, um, reflect this idea of complexity and that, yeah, purity has sort of been, been lost or the idea of being a linear essay has been lost. Um, I wanted to, we have a couple more minutes before we have to say goodbye and I will be very sad to do so. And I wanted to ask if there was anything in particular about craft or your process that you wanted to share, maybe even something that changed during the pandemic. Did anything change for you about your process during the pandemic that, that you've learned from that you want to share with potential writers of essays? Uh, and I will open that up to all three of you. So just talk over each other and talk about that. Well, I'll say the pandemic basically um, lit a fire under my ass and <laughs> made me start it. Wait, am I allowed to? Oh no, I probably am not allowed to. But anyway, yeah. Um, the pandemic really motivated me to um, to to really, you know, stop wasting time and to just just do it, you know, to do all of the outstanding projects and dreams that I've been wanting to make come true. That's what I I decided um, I was going to do, you know. And when I got, I actually got COVID, um, and that was like a big deal. And, you know, I felt as though, yeah, um, I have to do, I have stuff I want to write. I have things I want to say. And I would say, you know, to writers, just don't be afraid. Um, don't be afraid to just do it, you know. Um, and if you are putting off something uh, and avoiding doing it, maybe there's a reason why. Uh, and find out the reason why. And as soon as you realize why you're doing it, why you're afraid, just deal with it one time. Oh, wait, but no, but you were asking about process, like what changed in my process? And I just realized, I just went on and on <laughs> making this speech, this Miss Universe speech. And, but my process basically um, also changed a lot. I realized, I didn't realize how important music was to my writing until the pandemic and music became really really integral and um it may seem very you know simple but just the act of writing while music is playing kind of helped um put me in the mood of different types of um writing you know if i wanted to achieve a certain effect i played a certain song you know and that became a really interesting thing interesting thing i discovered about my process Others, did you have anything that you noticed that changed during the pandemic that has now continued? I just learned to ask for what I need um, because I um, I decided to feel less lonely that I would move into move back home, um, and so I was suddenly in a space where I had to, you know, I had the privilege of writing alone before, and now I just had like a big family that I needed to. To, um, to navigate and I just learned to be like you know be quiet you know I learned to sort of to sort of develop the skills that you need to be able to carve out uh you know quiet and space and time for yourself just to be able to focus and to and to, you know realize that that writers need 
special, unfortunately, and I know this is controversial as well, but I think that writers do, do sort of need special considerations um, just because of what the craft entails and whatever your your way of writing, you know, if you need quiet, if you need silence, if you need whatever. Yeah, I just learned to ask for it. And, and, and I think that has served me well, not only in the writing space. And um, I'll be brief on it. Uh, it was important because in the first time, I think it really collapsed some of the geographic boundaries with the virtual seminars, retreats, uh, fellowships. It was an opportunity that uh, I didn't have before. And uh, it really brought uh, global dialogues or regional dialogues in a way that uh, was not facilitated as easily for this um, large a larger group, you know. Only certain people had access to it. And not just the access, even the confidence to see themselves as part of that process. That was important. Uh, secondly, you know, it reminded me of the whole uh, law cut in Aruya. It's like closer to death than to philosophy, closer to grief than to intellect, closer to blood than to ink. Um, one of the realities that I had to grapple with, I understand, uh, it was uh, the pandemic was also a very heightened political moment. And uh, a lot of writers who had a lot of stature before action retreated. A lot of writers didn't have the language for the crowd when the crowd did get up, you know? A lot of activists didn't have it as well, you know? So we have those tensions. A lot of people said, well, I don't have permission to speak. A lot of people felt they now had the authority and the permission to speak. It was quite interesting to see the personalities flare up. Some, I see some people hide. I see some stars were born, some stars fell, you know, and how people occupy any moment. And I, it was a reminder because for a long while, I think uh, political work or politically charged work, it was, they thought it was cheap. They thought it was poetry, you know, for political sale. And now there's a kind of embrace to it. People want to add your work to the thesis because you're speaking about a moment ethnographically. You know, it's quite interesting to see that turn. It doesn't mean that I'm, I should ever go on cheap work or, or to use sloganeering as, as the way that I write. But I felt vindicated in many ways and I also see the gaps in the field of the work that I need to still contribute to. And, um, and hopefully that we could have more empowered writers who bring that same discipline that they do to writing. They do it to political work, activism, social organizing. Now, that's not the calling for all. I don't want to make activists of everyone. But those who do that could move beyond that feeling. And, and to say even I'm grappling with, um, I, I think that is sometimes a position that is not as useful as we think um, that it might be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to uh, thank you for bringing up the idea that during the pandemic, we were given these new platforms. I mean, the online platforms existed, but not to the extent that they do now. And without them and without the pandemic, we probably would not have been having this discussion. And I wouldn't have been privileged enough to be a part of this specific literary festival. I mean, I would have liked to think I would have been invited to the BVI Lit Fest, but it might not have been possible for me to get there, but it was possible for us all to meet virtually in the BVI, which this is a space that we are occupying right now, which is the BVI Literary Festival. And we are all occupying it from different places. And I think that that's a gift that the pandemic actually has given us. And on that note, we are going to have to wrap up. And I really want to thank, obviously, the BVI Lit Fest and Dr. Richard Georges and Dr. Catherine Smith, and especially my amazing panelists, Andre Bagu, Amanda Chukwan, and Amir, Amir Karsanathan for joining us and being a part of this discussion. It's been an absolute pleasure reading your work over the past couple weeks, month, and uh, getting to know you on the page and now getting to know you virtually on the screen. So thank you so much and keep writing and I will keep reading all of you. And I encourage everyone who's watching to read these three brilliant writers. And thank you, Tracy, for your wonderful questions. Thanks. And that's it. We're going to sign off. Bye, everyone. Bye.
Devon.